Well, again, it is good to see everyone out this morning. We're going to continue our series about salvation and today. And the song that we just sang sums up everything about the lesson this morning as we sang about the trial of Jesus. And you notice in the song that those trials started even before he went to the cross. And so in our series here about salvation, we're trying to answer the question, two questions that we find in Matthew chapter 16 and verse 26. Where Jesus says, What is a man profited if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? And question number two is, what will a man give in exchange for his soul? And looking at that verse and understanding the meaning of that verse, I think you understand that our soul is very precious. It is precious in God's sight, and therefore we should do all that we can do to understand the length to which God went in order to save and to redeem that soul. And so as I said last week, we began this series. And last week we looked at the very first part of our series because you can't start looking at salvation without understanding God's grace. Because it was through His grace that He sent His Son Jesus and so today we want to look at this idea of the death of Jesus. Now keep your Bible marked in Hebrews chapter 2 and verse 9. We're going to come to that in point number 2 of our lesson this morning. But I want to begin and I'm going to briefly talk about how Jesus suffered greatly when he died. Let's look first in Matthew chapter 20. As you look in Matthew chapter 20, beginning there in verse 17, notice it says, Jesus going up to Jerusalem took the twelve disciples aside on the road and said to them, Behold, we are going up to Jerusalem and the Son of Man will be betrayed to the chief priests and to the scribes, and they will condemn him to death and deliver him to the Gentiles to mock and scourge and to crucify. And the third day he will rise again. Brethren, this passage tells me that Jesus knew before he was crucified that he knew in advance. Now you might be thinking, and you can rightly think so, if you go back to the Old Testament, and you see the prophecies of Jesus there. I would suggest and tell you that Jesus knew before he ever came to dwell on the earth in flesh. He knew his faith. When I go to the book of Isaiah and I read the prophecies of Jesus there, I understand that Isaiah was talking about Jesus. Surely Jesus knew the words that were being spoken. So Jesus knew in advance that his death would be handled and done on the cross. And you notice there from Matthew 20, it says to me, that both Jew and Gentile were responsible for his death. It was the Jews who delivered him into the hands of the Gentiles who carried out that crucifixion. But then you go a little bit further over in the book of Matthew into chapter 26. And as you get into chapter 26, we remember this particular part of Scripture. In verse 36, as it says that Jesus came to Gethsemane and He looks at His disciples and He tells them to sit here 
while he goes and prays. But in verse 37, he took with him Peter and Zebedee, and he began to be sorrowful and deeply distressed. Brother, what does that mean that he was sorrowful and deeply distressed? He knew the time was imminent. He knew that it would not be very long before he suffered at the hands of the Jews and the Gentiles. And so he says to those, he says, my soul is exceedingly sorrowful even to death. Stay here and watch with me. Have you ever really wondered what they were watching for? Have you ever thought when Jesus left those three, what were they watching for? Were they not there to watch for the mob? Were they not there to watch for one of their own, Judas? Jesus positioned them there to be the lookout. And after he did that, the scripture says he went a little bit farther and he fell down. And he began to pray. And the greatest prayer in all of scripture is prayed when he says, Oh, Father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. That statement, that prayer, is a prayer that you and I as Christians ought to pray daily. We should not be concerned about our will just as Jesus was not concerned about His. He knew His fate. Brethren, do we know our fate? Do we know what is coming in our life? I'm so saying, Brother Ryan, I don't know what tomorrow may bring. Well, we're in Tennessee. It may snow one inch. It may snow two. It may snow 22. Who knows? Even the weather people can't agree on a forecast. But I promise you, I know one thing that is coming. And that is, I'm going to pass from this life to another life. I know that I am going to pass either to eternal life or to eternal punishment. Jesus knew his fate. And even though we know our fate, we ought to submit our will to the will of the Father. But not only did Jesus know his fate, not only was he troubled before his arrest, because he knew what was coming. Notice number three, how he was severely abused during those trials. Just go on down in Matthew chapter 26, and you can read verse 67 and verse 28, and you can go to chapter 27 and verse 26, and then verse 29 through verse 31. But as you look at what happens to Jesus, we understand that he was abused physically. And I mentioned this this morning as we were in our 6 a.m. service. We often focus solely on the cross where he hung, where he bled, and where he died. But I think, brethren, we have to go back before that to get the full picture of what Jesus did. And that goes back to the abuse that he went through before his crucifixion. Think, if you will, about this aspect of how he was led and as he was sentenced, the scourging that he went through. How he was beaten. How literally 
He was at the point of death before he ever got to the cross. Think about the suffering he had with the thorn or the crown of thorns being thrust down on his head. Jesus suffered tremendously during the trial before he ever got to the cross. And we know from Mark 15 and verse 25, there they crucified him. The most agonizing death known to mankind in all of history. From the day Jesus was crucified, even if crucifixion was practiced today, it would still be the most grueling and cruel death that one could die. Approximately six hours after they hung Jesus on the cross, he cries out, It is finished. And he gave up the ghost. Brother, understand something about the death of Jesus. He suffered greatly when he died. And I have to think about what Jesus went through. And oftentimes, I need to compare that to what I go through when it comes to pain and suffering. But you know what? When I think about my minor aches and pains, it's nothing compared to what Jesus went through for me. As Brother Van mentioned, Jesus took the weight of all sin upon Him as He hung on the cross. What a weight that is. But number two this morning, it is through the death of Christ that God demonstrated His grace and His love towards us. Go over, go back over to Hebrews chapter 2 and look at verse number 9. Brother Jerry read this for us, but we see Jesus who was made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death crowned with glory and honor that he, by the grace of God, might taste death for everyone. I want to focus for a moment on this phrase at the beginning of the verse where it says, who was a little lower than the angels. Brother, let me ask you a question. Does that mean that Jesus is less than the angels, the created being who ministers and ministered unto others? Absolutely false. We know that Jesus is part of the Godhead. He is God. He came in the flesh and was God with us. What this is saying to us when it says He was created a little lower than the angels is He is lower Himself below the angels so that He could come to this earth to walk in the flesh as you and I walk in the flesh. Had He not been both God and man, God's grace would never have been able to be completely shown. Let us understand that it was through the life, or the through the life, through the death, and through the resurrection of Jesus, that we see the grace of God extended.
if you drop down just a few verses in that same passage. Notice verse 2 through verse 14. The writer in Hebrew said, Inasmuch then as the children have partaken of the flesh and blood, he himself likewise shared in the same, that through death he might destroy him who had the power of death, that is, the devil, and release those who through the fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. Do you realize how blessed we are? When it says there that he came and to destroy the power of death. Oh yes, I realize that at some point in life, unless Christ comes again, my fate is going to be death, right? Your fate is going to be death. But I'm thankful that through Jesus Christ, He destroyed the power. He destroyed the stranglehold death had on man that we might be made alive just as He was made alive in His resurrection on the third day. He gives us that hope to an eternal life. Not eternal death. That's still within Satan's grasp. But I go back to the book of Romans chapter 6 and I look, or excuse me, chapter 5 and I look at beginning in verse 6 and I go down through verse 8 and I understand that that even while I was a sinner, while I was an enemy of God, the scripture says Christ died for me. Brother, I want you to think about the power of that statement. Who was a sinner? Who was an enemy of God before Christ died? Who? Everyone. But Brother Ray, the book of Hebrews tells us that they would come and they would offer that offering on the Day of Atonement and their sins would be... I've heard people say they'd be forgiven. That's what the Bible teaches. The Bible says that that sacrifice delayed the punishment for their sins. They were still sinners. You and I, we were once sinners. Yes, sometimes we still fall short. But go back over and continue reading in Romans chapter 6. Begin reading in verse 9 down through verse 11. Romans chapter 5, or excuse me, chapter 6, chapter 5, beginning in verse 9. Much more then, having now been justified by His blood, we shall be saved from wrath through Him. For if we, when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of His Son, much more, having been reconciled, we shall be saved by His life. And not only that, but we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we now receive the reconciliation. When man sinned in the garden, it was from that point on that man needed to be reconciled to God. We need to be brought back into a right relationship with Him. And we have that. And so when you think about the Lord's death and the great suffering that it involved on His behalf, along with what? The love of God. You and I see the grace of God demonstrated.
Now let's go to point number three. And that is how His death relates to us as Christians. Let's go over to the book of 1 Corinthians. And our good brother Paul, as he writes here in the book of 1 Corinthians, go back to chapter 11. And I'm going to begin in verse 23 and go down through verse 26. Paul says, For I have received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the same night in which he was betrayed took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take ye, this is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same manner he took the cup, set, ap, cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. This do as often as ye drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death till he comes. Why do we partake of the Lord's Supper every Sunday? The scripture commands us to do it upon the first day of the week. And at last time I looked at a calendar and I know there are 52 weeks in a year. Did y'all realize we had a bonus last year? We had 53. And on a normal year there are 52 weeks that have a first day. Why do we gather around the table on the first day of the week? Paul says you do it to proclaim the Lord's death. That is part of the covenant we make with Him. Or maybe we need to go over to 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and look at the first four verses. You and I were to stand in the gospel and we are to remember the gospel including the Lord's death. Paul says, Moreover, brethren, I declare to you the gospel which I preach to you, which also you received and with which you stand, by which you are also saved if you hold fast that word which I have preached to you, unless you have believed in vain. For I delivered to you first of all that which I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures. And that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day, according to the scriptures. And then Paul goes on and tells us who Jesus was seen by after the resurrection. You and I must stand firm in the gospel, defending the pure, simplistic plan of salvation. And we must commemorate and stand firm in our thoughts and our participation in the Lord's Supper. But number three here, we speak of that initial entrance into Christ by being baptized into His death, burial, and resurrection. But you know what happens if we fall out and we forget to remember where we stand? John tells us in 1 John chapter 1 and verse 7 that if we walk in the light as He is in the light, what? His blood doth continually cleanse us. What does it mean to walk in the light? Does it mean that we're trying to do the right thing? Do we fall short sometimes? Yes. Do we sin and maybe we don't even realize what we've done? Yes. That blood that continually cleanses me is an extension of God's grace. It's an extension of what He demonstrated through Christ dying on the cross and all the suffering that He went through, 
It confirms the reason why that he was created a little lower than the angels. Why he was made a little lower than the angels. It tells me that Jesus became like me to save me. And so the passages that we've examined this morning, and we can go to many, many others, it shows us how the death of Christ relates to our salvation. And we can go back over to Romans chapter 6. And we can look at verse 3 down through verse 7. Notice our brother Paul, he puts it very simply for us how we come in contact with the death of Jesus. Or do you not, or do you not know that as many of us as were baptized into Christ were baptized into his death. Therefore we were buried with him through baptism into death. And just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we should walk in newness of life. For if we have been united together in the likeness of his death, certainly we shall also be in the likeness of his resurrection. Knowing this, that the old man was crucified with him, that the body of sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves of sin. For he who has died has been freed from sin. This morning, do you understand the grace of God and how it was exhibited to you through the death of Jesus? It is only when you come and are baptized into His death that you can experience that resurrection to a new life. This morning you can do that. The water is prepared. We're ready to assist you. Or this morning, do you need to go back and think about 1 John chapter 1 and verse 7 where if we are faithful to confess and walk in the light that His blood will cleanse you. If you need the prayers of the church, maybe you're struggling with some sin. Maybe you need forgiveness for some sin. Are you willing to confess and to repent of that? Whatever your need may be, we pray you come while we stand and while we sing. Come to Jesus, he will save.